Hey y'all, Coach McFly here, guys. Stacy with me. Shalawama. And in today's class, we're going to be doing a Bible study on sanctification, consecration, and what all that actually means. All right. We're looking here at the calendar for the 12th month. And in the 12th month, about the 23rd day of the 12th month, you see referenced Jasher chapter 83 and verse 1. Mm -hmm. What this is talking about is how on the 23rd day of the 12th month, they was getting ready to finish the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. The first tabernacle created by Moses. Here they are almost a year later, and they've almost finished that tent or that tabernacle. And they're about to consecrate it or sanctify it. Right. So that's kind of why we're doing this class today. You know, doing this Bible study, I should stress that it is a Bible study because we want everybody else to participate. Mm -hmm. We, at least I am not absolutely confident that I know what it means to sanctify or to consecrate a person or to do it yourself. So we're asking those listening to participate in this Bible study too, maybe they have some information they can help us out with. Right. But on the 23rd day of the 12th month, like I said, we can see in the book of Jasher, chapter 83, all that they did in order to sanctify the priests, the sanctuary, the Levites, the tabernacle, everything. And this is important because we are now the living tabernacle. And so sanctification and consecration is important for us um, to be doing. Absolutely. I believe this is what's being talked about over there in Isaiah chapter one and in Amos chapter five, where we're being told that our father despises our feast days and such. Right. Well, we did a class not too long ago mm -hmm. talking about how the reason behind that is likely because we're not cleansing ourselves. Mm hmm. We see this talked about in Haggai chapter two, where he's addressing the priests and asking them about cleanliness laws. Mm -hmm. So I think that's related. And we covered that in that class, how that's related to our feast days. If we come in to a festival and touch the Passover or the other sacraments related to those holy days, us being unclean is actually making those sacraments unclean as right. well. Right. So this is another reason why this sanctification or this purification process is necessary because we are defiling the feast days, right. messing them up. Mm -hmm. And we see over in Second Chronicles chapter 29, the story of Hezekiah, right. who was one of the first kings to actually start implementing the laws and the feast days again after a period of time. Yeah. In the first month of his reign, the first thing he did was he went back and opened up the temple, got all of the documents out and actually started reading them, learning about the laws and what they Israel had been missing up until that point. Yeah, this was after a period of many um, evil um, kings that had done, you know, a lot of evil things in the sight of the father. Hezekiah came on the scene and now he was about to implement um, the way that the father um, wanted us to do him. That's right. He's known as one of the best kings. Mm -hmm. But the thing about it here in Second Chronicles, we find out even though he had just learned about Passover in the first month, he actually didn't fulfill Passover in the first month. When you go on to chapter 30, you see that he actually kept the Passover in the second month. Right. He took advantage of that caveat in the law, which mm -hmm. says that if you were unclean in the first month, you can actually keep Passover in the second month. Right. Well, you see in verse three that the reason why they did that was because the priests and the Levites had not been sanctified yet. Right. So you think about this. This is the king of Israel mm -hmm. who has just found out about the most important festival day under the council. He decided to forego keeping Passover in the first month, mm -hmm. putting everybody at risk and keep Passover in the second month, just so the Levites and the priests could be sanctified. Right. I guess that speaks on just how important it is, um, the sanctification as well as the consecration. 
Absolutely. And we see that they actually started the process on the first day of the first month mm -hmm. and sanctified the temple for 16 days over two weeks. Wow. Ending about the 16th day of the first month, which would have been in the midst of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Right. So it's already started. Right. So they decided to go through the sanctification process instead and keep the Passover in the second month. Right. So like you said, that proves that it's important. Right. But the question in this video is what exactly is sanctification? Right. We see this word used all over the scripture. It's actually used along with consecration. Mm -hmm. They're kind of used interchangeably. But we see some of the times, we'll look at some of the times that it was actually used in the Bible. For instance, how the Sabbath day was sanctified. Right. So what did our father do to sanctify the Sabbath day? Right. We don't have any idea. We don't know what he actually did behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. But then looking in Exodus chapter 2, we see that the firstborn was sanctified. Right. Mm -hmm. But looking over the story of Exodus, what did they actually do to sanctify the firstborn? Right. Mm -hmm. That was actually Passover. Passover was part of the sanctification of the firstborn. Right. Mm-hmm. But notice down here in verse 19, when this is Moses giving the command to sanctify the people, he actually went down and sanctified the people. Mm -hmm. So the question becomes, what did he do to sanctify them? But notice right here where he says, and let them wash their clothes. Mm -hmm. So this implies something to do with cleansing or something like that. Mm hmm. But then look down here in verse 14 is also talking about sanctifying the people and washing their clothes. Right. And then down here in verse 23, we find out that the mountain was also sanctified, was also sanctified. Right. So what is this sanctification process? What's going on here when you have the Sabbath day, the firstborn, the Levi's, the holy mountain, Mount Horeb? The priests as well as the beasts for the wave offering. Yeah, they were all sanctified. And we see down here that part of the sanctification process for the priests or the sons of Levi was to actually eat this food. Mm -hmm. This food that was made as part of this sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Simply by eating it, mm -hmm. they were consecrated or sanctified. Right. Mm-hmm. And then looking at consecrate, which, like we said, is used interchangeably, we can see that they consecrated the garments of Aaron and his sons. This will go along with what we were talking about in the book of Jasher, what they did in the 12th month. Right. This is explained here in Exodus chapter 28, kind of goes into some additional details there. But we're still left with the question, what is this consecration? What does it look like? Yeah, it seems as if there, there are... I don't know if I'll say many, but there's different ways of being um, consecrated, not just one um, official way of doing it. Absolutely. And like I said, that's the purpose of this study. We trying to understand how is it that we become sanctified? Mm -hmm. Looking over here at Google, I simply put that in. How do we become sanctified? Right. It says all one must do is live as Christ lived. Mm. Okay. Okay. According to the teachings of Christ, one must strive to live a holy life to be truly and considered holy. So according to Google, sanctification or consecration has something to do with being considered holy. Right. And then when we come to look at the concordance and look up the word Kadash, which is concordance number 6942, means to be set apart or consecrated. When I looked up the word sanctification, I was continually getting an understanding that it means to be set apart. I went into the study thinking that, you know, it means to be clean. And I get that coming from my church teachings. I know one of the things that we used to say, um, and maybe some can relate back in the Pentecostal religion, we would say we're saved, sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost. And I always thought that that word uh, meant cleanse. I was saved. I was clean and I was filled with the Holy Ghost. But throughout my studying of the concordance and the scriptures, I'm definitely thinking that it means to be set apart. Well, that's kind of what they were doing in Leviticus chapter eight, when the priests and the Levites were simply commanded to hang out by the tabernacle for seven days, mm -hmm. day and night. 
they were told to hang out by the tabernacle, like we see there in verse 35, to keep the charge of our father. Right. So from that chapter, what we gain is that the Levites or the priests were consecrated or sanctified by sitting at the tabernacle for seven days. Right. Mm -hmm. So like you said, what we're doing, we're finding all kinds of ways to be sanctified or to be consecrated. Mm hmm. But what it boils down to is to just be set apart. Yeah, to be set apart, um, I guess, for the work of the Father. You know, that I think the one thing that um, brought it home for me is the um, sanctification of the firstborn. We know that they're set apart. The Father calls them um, his own, and they are set apart from the rest of um, the people for doing the work of the father so it would be different those people all be would be different yeah although they may look the same they may have on some different garments mm -hmm. or they may have some other things that you know they would have gotten down there at the tabernacle mm -hmm. but when they return back to where we're at after the purification or the sanctification process is over they will come back to where we're at mm -hmm. with the only difference is that they are holy now right i mean my point is that you won't notice anything different about them physically mm -hmm. until you actually try to get them to do something that they know they're not supposed to. Yeah. You remember when um, the father called all the people up um, to Mount Sinai and he told them, told Moses to go and sanctify the people. Mm -hmm. There was a multitude of different people mm -hmm. that came out of Egypt with Moses, but to sanctify them, he was only calling for Israel. He wasn't necessarily calling for all the strangers and the other people to um, hear his instructions. Why do you say that? Um, because he told them to sanctify the people, to yeah, set but, apart them. Yeah, but how do you know that? Okay, but with Israel, there was a mixed multitude of people. Right. And is that who you're talking about? Yeah, I'm talking about the mixed multitude. Would they have been around the mountain as well? Yeah, they. there was no separation between the Gentiles that it would have been them part of that mixed multitude that would have been with them mm -hmm. part of these two million people there was never any distinction between them There's so but I thought some of their you know like some of the, the strangers wasn't they didn't partake of the full laws that Israel did right far as we know they did we, like I said there there's no distinction made not that I know of Okay. If you know of, some, of a verse or something where they're act where they actually made a distinction between them, the Gentiles that were with Moses and Israel that was with Moses, mm -hmm. you know, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't remember any distinction being made with them, other than the child who blasphemed. That's the only time, as far as I know, that any distinction between those Gentiles is being made. Okay. We know that they were there. Right. But they follow the same rules. Okay. All right. And that's similar to where we're at now, where the only difference between a Gentile and, a, and an Israelite is the keeping of the commandments, the keeping of the rules. So even though they may have left Egypt as Egyptians, once they started keeping the Passover and the other rules of the scripture, they would have been converted to spiritual Israel. Okay. All right. We see over here. Another place in Google, we looked up the word consecrated, and it's talking about the communion wine, mm -hmm. which kind of brings me to my other point, which was where did the Messiah go through this sanctification process or this consecration process before he was put on the cross as our lamb? So are we determining that the sanctification process is some sort of ritual or, you know, something like that? Well, some sort of process. It may have some rituals involved with the different elements or the different parts, but universally it's just to be set apart is what I'm gathering. Like so, I said, I'm, I am asking those in the comment section to help me out. So would the Messiah have been consecrated uh, from birth? Well... He would have been consecrated from birth being a Levite. That's mm -hmm. another biblical rule is that all of the Levites have to be consecrated from birth. They have to have be set apart from birth. Mm -hmm. But what we learned over in Hezekiah or Second Chronicles is that this was kind of like a yearly thing where there was something that would have taken place. At least that's what I'm gathering mm -hmm. from the story is that this would have been something they would have had to go through 
every year. But when we look at the gospel, we don't find the Messiah or his disciples going through any of this sanctification or purification process before Passover. Right, right. So what it appears to me now, this is this is you know where I'm giving my pit my opinion <laughs> of what, but it appears to me as though the Passover or the communion celebration is the sanctification process. Well, that would make sense, you know, going back from the beginning of when the Passover was was first implemented. Um, like you said, was there anything out of the ordinary that was done during that time of Passover? Uh, that we can say, yeah, this ritual, this process was happening um, to set them apart, or could it have just been the doing of Passover itself? You're talking about in the Old Testament? Right. Well, the placing of the blood on the doorposts would have been symbolic of cleansing the tabernacle, which is what Hezekiah and Moses were doing. They were cleansing mm -hmm. the tabernacle. But we're talking about our inner tabernacle. Right. And so now we have the communion wine, which is symbolic of putting that blood on our doorposts. So without much other evidence, I believe that the whole sanctification process that we're supposed to do in preparation for the spring festivals actually starts with Passover. And I say that again, only because of what the Messiah did. We don't have any examples of him sitting by the temple or the disciples sitting by the temple or them going through any sprinkling of the blood as they would have done to sanctify the tabernacle. We don't see anything in the Messiah's story mm -hmm. to prepare them or to cleanse them before Passover other than the Passover itself. Well, right before in John 17 and 17, and this happens right before um, the Messiah was betrayed and right before he was arrested, where he um, is praying for, it says, well, the, the, the title of the chapter says, the Messiah prays for his own. And he says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. 18 says, as I sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Now, do you think that has something to do, do with it being that we are right there in the midst of the Passover season? So you're right. This is our Messiah who is going through some type of sanctification process on his own. Through prayer. It's like he's sanctifying himself. As well as them, because it says sanctify them through that truth, which kind of makes the point that I was trying to make earlier. Mm -hmm. Where are the disciples at here? Right. This is the Messiah that's doing all of this. Mm -hmm. I mean, chances are they didn't even know that he was doing this or that this has actually happened because there was no ritual. There was nothing involved. There mm -hmm. was no steps involved that we see that they actually had to take. Now, if you had have told them to go sit down there by the tabernacle for seven days, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, but that did, we don't see that happening. But we do see this sanctification going on right around the time of Passover. Right. So this sanctification would have been part of what he was doing in order to prepare himself. Right to fulfill that mission right. of the Passover lamb. Mm -hmm. So he's sanctified, but what about the rest of us? When, right. do, when do the rest of us get sanctified if it's not Passover? When do the rest of us get consecrated? I believe it's at Passover. And like I said, I'm doing this class so people can help me out, but I don't see scripture telling us anything other to do to get prepared for the spring festivals other than the purification, the cleansing of our tabernacles, which happens they're at Passover. We learn in the book called the Epistle of Barnabas that once we get the remission of our sins, matter of fact, I'm looking here at this verse. Right. It says mm -hmm. oh, for the, go ahead and read it. It says for to this end, the Lord endured to deliver up his flesh to corruption that we might be sanctified through the remissions of sin which is affected by his blood of sprinkling. Okay, well, we're sorry for wasting all of you guys' time. <laughs> <laughs> Skip right here to this verse, but 
that proves it. Right. You know, that proves the sentiment or the intuition that I was having about Passover being the only sanctification process that we go through now. Mm -hmm. I believe this is confirmed in the book of Barnabas, which says that we might be sanctified through the remission of sins, which happens at Passover. Right. So that would explain why we don't hear anything about mm -hmm. anything before Passover. Right. There's, because it's, I guess it's sort of like a silent sanctification or individual thing right. now mm -hmm. where each individual person is expected to go through that on their own. Mm -hmm. And so there's not a big deal like it was back there with two million people in Moses. Right. But mm -hmm. it's still the same sanctification process. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the purpose of Passover. That's when we get sanctified. I guess that's why we don't hear about any other days or instructions or anything like that. Even where we started back there in Jasher chapter 83 was unique to the first tabernacle, it seems. And once again, we say the reason or the uh, purpose of the sanctification is why? So that we don't defile the tabernacle. Right. So that we don't mess up the sacraments. Mm -hmm. You know, we go in and make our father's house unclean. Right. I mean, we want our efforts that we do on the feast days to be counted right, right. but if we're unclean mm -hmm. then that could present a problem like i said we could end up being despised for even doing right the festivals the mm -hmm. feast days so it could have been that the people were going into the reason that the father said he hate you know the feast days is because the people were going into them um not consecrating or sanctifying themselves. Unclean. Right. They're going into them unclean. Mm -hmm. You could imagine without this sanctification process going on, the people around the world celebrating Passover would be amongst many who would be defiled, who would be unclean themselves, who will have their spiritual uncleanness upon them, which can and probably will end up with probably will end up hurting them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I guess that lends to the idea of why we can't miss Passover. Why it's so important. Absolutely. And definitely for whatever reason that you don't make the first one that, you know, I think it's just so gracious that the father will give us the second one just to make sure we get this, get this done. Well, it just shows you how important Passover is. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the only festival that you're given a second chance. Right. And I believe it's for this very reason, at least from what we gained from Hezekiah is to be sure that everybody is prepared. You know, so you have those who have been on this walk for a while who will be sure to go through the sanctification process ahead of time, mm -hmm. even at the last day at Passover, can help those in the second month who weren't prepared. Right. Right. Helping to bring many more of our father's people into the fold, which is part of our responsibility. Yeah, it that's is. what Daniel was talking about in chapter 12 when he says we will shine like the stars forever and ever. Mm -hmm. Well, we need to be inviting everybody to this Passover celebration so that they can get sanctified or consecrated and get ready for unleavened bread. Right. And in one of our future videos, we'll be talking about when exactly those days will be up on us. So make sure you're subscribed. Make sure you hit that like button and please leave us a comment. If you agree with our conclusion here that <laughs> Passover is the sanctification process, we'd love to hear it. But if we're missing something, we'd love to hear that, too, because, like you said, it's important to get this right. Right. Mm -hmm. And with that, we're going to close this video out. And see you in the next video. Shalom. Shalom.